What's going on guys? Hit pause here with another example of how you can use a data curve or a timeline uh, to control behaviors as well as other things like precision. In the last video I showed you guys how to use it to control the precision of a slider if it's really, you know, really uncontrollable and it just doesn't feel good on the slider you could try piping it through a timeline and bring it under control in that that way uh, in the case of what you're seeing here which was our game jam entry for June um, it's actually being used right now to keep these guys apart if you notice there's no clustering there's an even spread of them everywhere pretty much um, they're all on the move they're not getting stuck um, they're not dilly dallying around in the middle they're getting close enough to the candidates so that they could scoop these guys in. This game is Hungry Hungry Hippos. Candidates just scoop them into the hole. It's a one-button game. It's all, it's all personality and polish on this one. Okay? So what I'm doing here, and I'll just uh, show you. Go ahead and stop this. On our voters, which are driven, it, uh, getting errors only because I'm simulating, um, the voters are driven entirely by physics. Now, I got the color here kind of wrong, but uh, it actually makes sense in my head for some reason. Uh, what, what they are is, notice that they're simulating physics here. If I look in the viewport, they are just a visual mesh being placed over a sphere. The sphere is simulating physics, and on the event graph, it is constantly impulsing itself towards an attractor point. Okay, looking at this right here. We're finding the look at rotation between itself and the attractor point. The attractor point is actually just hard coded to be 0, 0, and then 350, which is the whole world is based on world 0. That is, you can see here in the details that I'm at 0, 0, 0. That is world zero. Okay, it's down here on the grid, so we moved it up. That's all. So the attractor point is about right here. So it looks at that and basically just constantly impulses itself towards it. Now, that's the final result. So what we end up with, whenever you do a look at and you want to push something towards something, you kind of need to get you get a look at and you get the forward vector and then you multiply that by a strength. Now originally this was piped right there. It just bypassed it. None of the other stuff was here. Okay. Uh, these are additional things that we added to bring their behavior me, uh, under control. Okay. So the rotation that's happening here is merely to align the mesh um, which is just linked to the billboard. So we, we change the rotation of the billboard um, to just keep it basically upright based on its velocity. So we wanted to point the direction that it's moving. Okay, we, we needed to rotate it 90. That was just consequential. We saw that it needed it. Um, and then essentially we just, we are interpret a little bit slower. This is on tick. We can't do anything about it. Um, we feed in delta time and we just are interpret this thing to be basically straight up but pointing the direction that he's moving. Okay, so we get the rotation from x, so it's kind of its forward vector in this sense because we're doing it off of speed. When you get, if this was an angle, you would get the forward vector, but because it's a velocity, we need to make a rotation from the x. Okay, and um, based on where it currently is, which is linked to the capsule, which is constantly wanting to roll with the capsule. Okay, um, so it's actually constantly being rolled, and then this is unrolling it. That's essentially it, but it gets drifted a little bit behind so we get some funny behaviors. Uh, however, where uh, the important part is here in the timeline. So what we do is we are constantly getting a distance, which is just a subtraction between the actor, which is the voter himself, and that center point. Based on that distance, we feed this in to a new time and we do the same thing that I showed in the last video where we set this to new time. This isn't going to play, it's just going to be constantly reset to a different time, but the time is actually a distance. So what we've done is our time is from 0 here to 2048. This length has no consequence when you set new time, just keep that in mind. Okay. However, this could be very easily 2048 and it won't 
change anything. So what we do is based on the distance, we get a curve here. In our case, we're doing it from 0 to 8. Um, we could have done a, this from 0 to 1 and done a multiplier after that, but we kind of hard set on this. We didn't want it changing. So essentially what happens is the further you are away, let's say he's 2,000, let's say he's 5,000 units away. It's going to put the playhead way over here. And it's going to be like, what's the value? Right now it's 8. Okay, you can see at time 5,000, the value is 8. Okay, as we start getting over here though, remember, okay, now let's say he's 1,500 units away. He's about right here. His value is going to be 4.5, which is 4.5 times more than his normal impulse strength because we're using this to drive the strength of him. You can see that the strength coming out of here, it's actually even named strength, is being multiplied by this over here. Now, this I'm going to explain right now just so you guys don't get confused. This is a flip-flop based on whether or not the voter is getting in and out of the arena. So as he comes in, uh, what happens is if he goes under a certain value, his strength, remember he's constantly impulsing with a strength that's pointing directly towards the middle. Right? That's what he's trying to do at all times. That's all he cares to do is come straight in like that. So this is actually raised up a little bit too to keep also keep them away from it. It's a little bulge here. I don't know if you can tell. But um, so as he comes in, but if he gets if if we constantly if we just left it like that, he would they would all get here and then they would just and they would just stay there and they would spin around and they would do no stupid stuff. So what we did was we said, okay, well if you got close enough within like 300, just go ahead and reverse the strength. So he'll be like, oh, I just I just passed it. Okay, well now I want to go away. Now naturally, if he were alone, what would happen is whatever we set that distance to, he would eventually go boing and he would vibrate right there forever. He would just get stuck on that ring because if he got too far away, he would go towards it. If he got too close, he would go away from it. And he would just get stuck there, and like I said, he would vibrate. Now, they actually do do that, and I can prove it. They do that because they are bumping each other away at all times to keep the dynamics going. Notice he's just stuck. Like I said, so if they're not kicking each other out of the way, eventually we're going to see a ring of them appear around. And you'll notice that this ring that they are slowly forming here is keeping them right around that free throw line. Notice where they are on the arrows over here. They are exactly within like distance to keep them right where you can snatch them up. You see that? Around that ring. Now, what happens is the behavior, like I said, of them knocking each other around is what prevents this from happening. This is what keeps this from, from, from actually transpiring. But just so you guys can know that you can see how the data curve or, or that, that flip-flop is keeping them in the ring. But you'll also notice that some of them are moving around okay. Like, they're not vibrating in totally one spot. There's a few of them that are, okay? There's a few of them that are bouncing into each other and that are stuck and they can't really do anything about it. But the ones that are actually being left alone and not, not getting stuck on stuff, they're not totally spazzing. Notice how slow he's moving. Why is he moving so slow? Why is he going real slow one way and on the other and not just constantly zippering back and forth, just vibrating, trying to get to that spot? Instead, he's doing this slow fluctuation back and forth. And the reason is, is because, let me put the bump and uglies back on because that keeps them knocking each other around. Okay, so the reason for that is because of this here. When they are around the time, they get this extra little push but they also get this dip right here right when they get to 500 right around that radius that they're stopping at they lose power entirely so what ends up happening is even though they're trying to push themselves towards it to get this radius they don't have enough thrust to actually do anything about it so this curve was absolutely essential now if we got them too close to the middle we needed them to rush out which meant we need to push this up. Now if I push this way up, like say like way, way up, like a thousand or something, as soon as they got to the middle, you would see them just 
blink off the screen. They would look like they disappeared because based on this data curve is how much strength they have. So this kind of thing is super handy and all you got to remember to set it up is you need to feed it into set new time. You don't play, you don't do any of this. Okay, if you want to you want to say, "Hey, I want to, you know, input something here and I want a completely customized output based on just a simple uh, data input here. Because remember, this it's okay, it's a timeline, but we're using it as a data thing. We could do this in matinee and UDK, by the way, way back in the day. I'm sure the creative people know how to do it. Um, but essentially, like I said, we just feed it where along the time. So they call it time, but it's really just the x axis, okay? And then you retrieve a value off of the y axis, which would be value. So time, value. Hopefully, I have double explained it, and that is enough. And hit pause, sign it off. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.